I'm, I'm about to join a. I'm about to join a Zoom call. Oh, so this is Alan Bombastic Budman welcoming you to the FJMC production of Bill After on Wrestling. Is wrestling broke? I didn't know it was fixed. Oh, yeah. Is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. There we go. Finally got that out. I am honored to say that I've been friends with Bill for about 25 years now. He's a tremendous individual. I know you guys know him as a as the professional wrestling expert in the United States. He's been involved with wrestling his literally his entire life yeah. as a photographer, a writer, an interviewer, broadcaster. As long as it's oh, he's work. met all he's met all the greats, and that's because he's one of them himself. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, or gentlemen and gentlemen, Bill After. <laughs> Well, thank you. Glad to be here. And so you can call me the guru of pro wrestling, actually. So uh, I thank I'm very I'm thrilled that uh, so many people showed up for this. And again, my this is all based upon my uh, book is wrestling fixed. I didn't know it was broken. And uh, people have asked me and I will take questions in a while too. people have asked me why that title. So ECW Press, which is a Canadian publisher. Uh, called me in 2012 and they asked me if I would do a book and I didn't want to do it. Uh, finally, seven years ago, I decided to do it and they were going to title it Bill After's Life in Wrestling. He said, no, wrong. <clears throat> I said, just like the wrestlers, you have to market this. You have to have a catchphrase. I said, I want a lot a, 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 a cover that's loud, that looks like one of the old wrestling magazines that I used to work for, and the catchphrase. And they said, well, do you have a catchphrase? I said, back in the late 70s, I was in Marietta, Georgia, and I was shooting, a, photographing a match uh, of Mr. Wrestling number two against Abdullah the Butcher. And it was a very bloody match. And after the match, this little kid came over me and said, he said, Mr., well, that rat one fixed. And I just looked down at him and I said, I didn't know it was broken. Cause, and his father said to me, well, son, you can't fix something that's not, uh, that's, that ain't broke. So that became, that was the impetus because back then uh, you protected the business. Today, Vince McMahon has come out and you know said it's sports entertainment. But uh, I started off watching wrestling in the uh, mid sixties and got into the business in 1970. And the wrestling business back then was very protected. It was like the mafia. You had to know someone. Who's got a TV or something going on there? Oop, I heard a TV or something there. So um, it was very protected. So when people ask you if wrestling was uh, fake, fixed, or anything, you couldn't say like you do today. It's entertainment. But do guys get hurt? Is it real that way? Yeah. There are uh, there's a, uh, injuries. There are people who have lost their lives in the wrestling business. Um, so my job with the wrestling magazines, more than anything I, I wrote, more than anything I photographed, was the people in the business trusted me. I became the, the liaison between the office and the wrestlers because the wrestlers were extremely protective about protecting the business. And some of the guys really liked me and some of the guys didn't like me. So what I did is uh, during the years, I collected a lot of stuff. As you can see behind me here in Actors Alley, uh, there's a WWE belt up here that one of my fans sent me made out of 450 Legos. He built that for me. Um, over here is a uh, wooden statue of uh, Bruno San Martino. That's full size there. You all remember Bruno? Everybody's on. Everybody's muted, Bill. Besides you and me, he was my favorite. Uh, Bill Bruno San Martino. I grew up with Bruno. All right. Well, Bruno was one of my dearest friends. Um, so I started collecting things. And one of the guys during one of the studio photo sessions that I did, one of the guys flipped me the bird, gave me the finger, and I took his picture, and I made a scrapbook. So from the scrapbook, when I do my live shows. I figured, you know, something would be very entertaining to open my show with a video showing a whole bunch of guys flipping me the bird. So I've got that here now. I call it finger fun. So for about a minute and 20 seconds, 
enjoy these very special wrestling fingers. It's the Road Warriors. We just lost Animal. Jake the Snake Roberts. Ole Anderson. Diamond Dallas Page. And that's me with his stogie. Larry Zabisco. A Ninja Turtle. I love that one. His name was Rest Reckless Youth, independent wrestler. Juventud Guerrero, one of the great luchadors. The Insane Clown Posse, who made me a juggalo. China, if you remember her. The Blue Meanie, and that's me with the Mr. Wrestling number two mask. Mike Tyson, that's one of my favorites. Sunny, she was the first diva in pro wrestling. The Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. Ronnie Garvin and the late, great Gary Hart. David Arquette, you all know him. Former WCW champion, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, if you will. Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, and Kurt Hennig. There's a guy on the toilet who gave me a finger. He broke his hand and gave me the finger anyway. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. There's a fan in Texas wanted me to move out of his way. So <laughs> took a picture first. Don Morocco, how many of you remember him? Scott Hall again, he loved giving me the finger. The late, great Owen Hart. Jerry the King Lawler, and we've got to tell you the story about him after this. Paul Heyman, when he had hair, and a, look at that cell phone. Ric Flair, Luthez, and Nature Boy Buddy Rogers came up to give me the finger. That's me with uh, Taz. Bubba Ray Dudley, double finger from him. <laughs> the Rock, you remember that guy? Dwayne Johnson? Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's The Undertaker. And look at that shirt, Nature Boy Ric Flair. <laughs> I've slept with the best. It's my favorite shirt. Did you enjoy that? All right, well, applause is fine. That's good. That's, that, that's good. So the reason I picked out Jerry Lawler, and people always ask me this question, is one of the main things that I'm known for, and it's on the cover of my book, is Wrestling Fixed. What's the answer, Zachary? Everybody's muted, Bill. Oh, I didn't know it was broken. Thank you. Okay, just want to make sure you got it. All right. So on the cover of my book, you'll see a picture of me with Andy Kaufman. Right there. Do you all remember Andy Kaufman? He played Latka on Taxi. Well, Andy wanted to be a pro wrestler. And in his act, um, he used to wrestle women, uh, Carnegie Hall and every place he appeared. And he used to come to the shows at Madison Square Garden. And he used to talk to Vince McMahon Sr. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. was uh, a wrestling promoter who didn't want any showbiz I'm out of focus. Let me get me back in focus here. He um, he didn't want any show. But I don't know why my camera keeps going out of focus here. Hang on a minute. All right. Well, anyway, uh, Vince McMahon did not want any showbiz in his wrestling at all. He played it, played it straight, not like his son. So Andy was backstage one night and he came over to me. He knew me from the wrestling magazines. And he said, I really want to be a wrestler. So he said, what are you doing after the matches? I said, well, I'm going back home. He said, where do you live? I said, in Queens. This is Madison Square Garden. He said, well, how do you get home? I said, well, I take the E train or the F train. He says, can I come with you? So now here's the Andy Kaufman, the star of Taxi on the subway with me um, on the F train, sitting there and people looking at him, oh, it's, yeah, it's Andy Kaufman. So we got up to my apartment. At that point, I was living with a, uh, uh, a young lady from uh, Australia. 
named Susan Sexton. She was the Australian wrestling champion. And every other word out of her mouth was the F-bomb. And uh, Andy and I walked into my apartment. He says, hey, mate, and hey, uh, F and Andy Kaufman, huh? What are you doing here? So we sat and we talked about wrestling for about an hour and a half and how much he wanted to be like Buddy Rogers or F Freddie Blassie. And she couldn't take it anymore. And she was a girl wrestler. She went in the bedroom, put on her headphones, listened to the Ramones, Gabba Gabba Hey, and that was it. So I said to Andy, I said, Vince McMahon is not going to let you do any of this at all. There's a guy in Memphis by the name of Jerry the King Lawler. And Jerry the King Lawler's federation there, USWA, is way ahead of the game. They do a lot of shtick. They have a Frankenstein monster, a mummy. So he said, well, do you think we can call them maybe tomorrow? I said, wait a minute. I said, he's one o'clock in the morning, our time. Memphis, it's midnight. He said, well, it's late. I said, we're wrestling people. We're up all night. So picked up the phone, no cell phones back then, as you know. And I called Jerry Lawler and he says, you got Andy Kaufman, the guy from Taxi in your little roach infested apartment. I said, yeah. And I put him on the phone with uh, Jerry and that put the key in the ignition. And you'll remember the, uh, the few Jerry Lawler had with uh, Andy Kaufman and the famous slap at the David Letterman show that was probably the, uh, uh, the biggest slap ever heard around the world. It was all over the newspapers the following day. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my uh, uh, claim to fames here. So uh, before I go to the next video, anybody have any other questions? Well, let me unmute, hold on. Okay, well, anybody wants to ask a question, please unmute at this time. Wasn't the Dave Schultz slap of John Stossel bigger? No, it wasn't because uh, the, it didn't get, it, it, the, the, that uh, was not publicized the way the Andy Kaufman yeah, no, no. shot. The, the Andy Kaufman thing actually still today, is, this is driving me crazy because I'm a tech guy and the, my camera's never gone out of focus here. And I don't know why it's doing that now. So, my, well, my hand is in focus. Your hand's perfectly in focus. Yeah, yeah, very weird. Never had the focal this. Point is, the focal point is uh, before you, that's why. Yeah, no, sort of. this, is, this has never happened. But, so, um, so no, that was really the, uh, uh, the shot heard all around the world. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, Can you, um, my name is Ira, by the way. Ira hello, Ira. Any, anyway, um, Maybe you can expound, is there a backstory to, in the mid-1970s, I went to the match, I saw it on closed circuit TV at the Baltimore Civic Center, Muhammad Ali versus the Japanese wrestler Antonio Anoki, where he, where he fell to his back and just started kicking Muhammad for 15 rounds. There is a backstory there. Uh, I was at the press conference. Um, Muhammad Ali and I, uh, actually, I don't know if I have that on here. Hold on a minute. Uh, I did a 25-minute uh, interview with Ali, which I'm not going to show you right now. Um, but let me just scroll down here. Um, Anoki, as you know, was uh, a championship wrestler. And oh, by the way, here, let me show you this. Andy Kaufman. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm a New Yorker. It's Andy Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> Got to say that right. Uh, so... We also did, beside the wrestling magazines, we did boxing magazines. And Ali was an, a huge wrestling fan, huge wrestling fan. And anytime I would cover the boxing press conferences to go and see him, uh, he would always call me over and want to do an interview. If you go to the WWE website and you put in Bill After Interviews Muhammad Ali, it's all about the Inoki fight. And I've got Ali uh, being contradicted by uh, Howard Cosell in that interview, Ali was going, I'm gonna whoop this wrestler, no wrestlers ever gonna whoop me. I'm the greatest Howard Cosell. And Cosell would say, Muhammad, I think you are underestimating yourself. <laughs> um, so there was no backstory there. Uh, the, the, the people uh, behind Ali were deathly afraid that he was going to get hurt. I was at Shea Stadium that night where the Andre the Giant Chuck Wepner fight was coming live. Sure, Andre killed him. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So I did a, uh, for the Ali fight, 
I did a uh, every round by round play by play with um, Bruno San Martino on that. And we thought that um, Ali was trying to bait Anoki to get up because if Ali hit him once, you know, in the face, knocked him out, that was it. But on the other hand, if Anoki got Ali down, they were worried Ali was going to get hurt. So no, there's no real backstory in that thing. It was just, uh, uh, it was a boring match. For oh, Phil horrible. Collins to watch that. It was terrible. The best part was, the, the, Bill, was the week before when Ali was in the front row of the wrestling match and he went into the ring with Gorilla Monsoon. Yeah. And Gorilla Monsoon threw him down an airplane spin, spin and threw yeah. him down. And, you know, he doesn't know a wrist lock from a wrist watch. You know? That's right. That's right. That's right. Any other questions at this point? During this time, what do you think was the most underrated wrestling promotion? During this particular period of time? During, during the particular, uh, during the 70s and 80s before, uh, before Vince Jr. took over the oh, that, WWF. That would have been Memphis. That would have been Memphis or the AWA. Bryn Gagne's AWA, yeah, for sure. Bryn Gagne had Hulk Hogan before anybody had Hulk Hogan. Well, actually, he had him after WWF. Uh, and then he, Hogan went back there and became a, uh, uh, an absolute megastar, as you know. Uh, also, I have a, another question. Do you think Toots Mont should be in the WWE yeah, Hall of Fame? I don't think anyone would remember him. I know who he is, and you know who he is. And of course, <laughs> but they're no, no fan of today. The WWE so Hall of Fame, which uh, Neil is talking to somebody on yeah. the phone there. Neil, if you're right. phone, please mute yourself. <laughs> Yeah. You're making so Neil's, 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 making act, Neil's actually talking to me. Neil, I'm live. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm here. So, I'm uh, here. The fans, the WWE Hall of Fame, um, a lot of people point to as um, uh, very political and that it's uh, show busy, et cetera. Uh, and it is. So Tutsmont might go in. Uh, you, you people who don't know who he is, he's been dead forever. He was one of the great WWE promote WWF. WWWF promoters of all time uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, people today don't remember who he is, unfortunately. Yeah. Bill, Bill, Bill this is Stephen Rimmer in Nashville. Uh, there are a lot oh, of- Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Stephen, hold on a minute. I don't know if you can see this, but can you see the back of my jacket? Uh, Nashville, yes. Nashville, yes, I knew you were gonna be here. Thank you. Uh, there were a lot of great wrestlers before, uh, I'm in 19, focus, yeah. Hey, thank you, right. before 1980. But was Hulk Hogan uh, so charismatic because of his personality or because of the promotion that Vince McMahon provided him? It's both, it's both. Hogan started, Hogan was an entertainer. He was a guitar player and he had a good personality back then. It wasn't brought out when he started wrestling in uh, Florida and Memphis. He uh, started showing some personality, but they held him back because Guys didn't want their spots to be taken. Once he got into the uh, AWA, he started showing more of that charisma, but it was the team of Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan that made Hulkamania successful. Neither of them could have done it without the other guy. It was and he like was Ali couldn't have done it without Joe Frazier. Yeah, but Hulk Hogan became real famous when he appeared in Rocky Three. Well, that that's, that's another story, but nobody knew he had that charisma. He was asking me about the charisma. So the story about Hulk Hogan and Rocky III, which I didn't even have on my list to remember to talk about, is uh, I got a call at the wrestling office one day at the publishing company from Sylvester Stallone's office. And what are you looking for? We're looking for a type to play this guy named Thunderlips in Rocky III. I said, okay. So they knew our magazine. So I sent them pictures of two guys I sent them pictures of this young kid, Hulk Hogan, and another guy named Superstar Billy Graham. You all remember him? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So Hogan got the part. Superstar Billy Graham did not get the part. So uh, I called Hogan, and I couldn't get him. There were no cell phones. So I called his mother, Ruth, and she said, Stallone's people want to talk to my son. They, they all thought this was a rib. They all thought it was a joke. And finally... I got a hold of Arnold Skolan, who was one of the road managers for the WWWF. He got a hold of Hogan, who called me and says, hey man, I hope this isn't a rib. 
and I funneled him to, uh, to Stallone. Yeah, so that's one of the ways that happened. So good question. Good hey, question. Hey, Bill. I talked to Stallone once, by the way. You know what he said to me? That was it. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, Bill. In, in, the, in the late 60s, and early, mid 60s to the early 70s, was, re, was wrestling pretty regionalized? It was I, totally regionalized. I, mean, I grew up in Chicago, and there was a Dick Butkus and the uh, Dick, uh, Dick, Dick Cabruza Cabruza. and the Crusher. And, yeah, yeah. Now, Dick Cabruza was banned from the was banned from Square Garden. But yeah, then I go to New York for a couple of years. I'm watching and going like, who are these guys? Yeah, well, uh, once in a while, Vince Sr. would bring in uh, the Crusher, Reggie Lasowski, yeah. uh, to Madison Square Garden for shots. But back in the 60s and most of the 70s, until McMahon expanded in the 80s, uh, everything was territories. The problem was that when he, his dad respected all the territories. There were so many, there was AWA, NWA, uh, Mid-South, Mid-Southern, everybody had their own, uh, their own territories. And once Vince, Able TV came out, Vince McMahon Jr., after his father died, Vince McMahon Jr., decided not to keep the, uh, uh, what all the old promoters were doing and staying out of everybody's territories. And cable TV came out and he got on cable and he started paying uh, TV stations to put them on the air. And they were never getting money to get put on the air before. They were putting on these small promotions like WWA from, uh, from Chicago. Um, so yeah, what Vince did changed the entire business. There are still territories uh, there are still little pockets of uh, towns in like uh, Georgia and uh, uh, the Carolinas and California that still run independent promotions, but they, they're not on the level of like the local TVs were. Your local TVs there were incredible there. I remember seeing tapes of them with uh, uh, Lord Athol Layton as the broadcasters. Great stuff. Great stuff. Any other question before I run the next video? Go ahead, Bill. run it. What's that? Please run Bill. it. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I'm sure you get this a lot. Do you think that Carlos Colon Sr. was behind the unfortunate murder of Bruder Brody? I can't say Yes, because I, number one, I wasn't there. Um, I think that uh, what happened to Brody was, of course, very unfortunate. He was a very dear friend of mine. Um, and it was probably preconceived by he and Gonzalez and several other people there. I don't think they, they actually were going to kill him. I really don't. I think they were going to hurt him, but I don't think they were going to kill him. Um, but yeah, very, very sad uh, story uh, of events there. Uh, I talked to his, uh, to his wife, uh, Barbara, regularly. She comes to a lot of the reunions and the conventions and lovely woman. And uh, we all miss him quite a bit. He was, he was a great competitor. Do you remember when they called, his name was Frank Goodish? Mm. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why that changed. They were going to bring him in to New York as Bruiser Frank Goodish. And Vince McMahon Sr. said, no, he's a bad guy. That doesn't make sense. So he said, we want to uh, make this a little more ethnic. And they said, well, let's give him an Irish name. We'll give him Brody. And that's why they changed his name to Bruiser Brody. He was also King Kong Brody. Yes, he was. Absolutely. And Jack Absolutely. River, or Red River Jack. Yeah, he's got his Wikipedia page up there. <laughs> Not to be confused with King Kong Bundy. No, King Kong Bundy was uh, was uh, was another guy. King Kong Bundy. Who remembers what King Kong Bundy's finisher was? The splash. The splash. But what did he have to do when he pinned the guy? What did he have to do? Count to five. Five count. Yeah, count to five. Oh yeah, <laughs> five count. All right, I'm going to show you another video from my uh, from my one man show here. Um, I already showed you the, uh, oh, wait, I just found this. Hold on. This might be the show shot. No, oh, there's me shooting pictures uh, at the garden. Pedro Morales against Moondog Rex. Can you see that? Yep. 
That's at Madison Square Garden. Um, here's the other thing I told you about. One of my old dear friends, he loved wrestling and he was, anytime he'd see me, he'd go right through the press corps. And I traveled with him for years. I traveled with him, George Foreman, Jerry Quarry. We did uh, Ring Magazine. So I was, I shot a lot of the, uh, uh, the great fights. So one of the things that, uh, since we're all in a Jewish men's club here, when my daughter Haley was at Mitzvah, um, Jerry Lawler couldn't give me money. I couldn't accept money from him for introducing him to Andy Kaufman. So he's a fine artist, Jerry Lawler. And he said, well, what, maybe I can do something for your daughter's confirmation. He'd never heard of a bar mitzvah before. So my daughter's theme, and I think Alan, I think you were there, was uh, uh, Planet ha Haleywood. Her name is Haley. So Jerry Lawler took four of my daughter's favorite planets, Planet Haleywood, and he drew these, I'm gonna to need to stand up to show you this. He drew these cartoons for her. This was Planet Pooh. And there's her with, can you all see that okay? Looks just like by Jerry Lawler. This is his artwork. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, my son Brandon was a huge wrestling fan. Huge wrestling fan. So I decided to do something different for his birthday. This runs about two or three minutes. Take a look at this. I think you'll get a big kick out of this. Let me turn the uh, turn the volume up. I, my kids didn't have a normal life. They were half half naked men in bathing suits always in their lives. <laughs> Enjoy this. Brandon's Ball Mitzvah. March 4th, the year 2000. The Bar Mitzvah. Everybody out there wondering who's going to show up, who can't show up, who's been invited, who hasn't been invited. Well, by long distance, is one guy who can't be there, but Brother Brandon, he wants to tell you something. He wants to talk right to Brandon right now. Come on in, secret web. We have a big outward about his far stuff in the 2000s. Right there. That's the day I come to your house, brother. I watch Brandon out of his bed, drag him down to the chair, and start breaking the half, brother, because he will be the new tag team partner of Hollywood Hulk Hogan to take a wrestling. Another one of uh, check this one out. <laughs> Brandon, this is The Rock, the most electrifying man in sports entertainment. And The Rock says, on this very special day, happy bar mitzvah. 13 years old, you're becoming an old man, kid. Well, The Rock says this, have a great one today. And if you smell what The Rock is cooking, you go ahead and raise your right hand and lay the smack down on your old dad, Bill, after. Again, Brandon, happy bar mitzvah if you smell what The Rock is cooking. All right, well, like I said, a little uh, unusual childhood uh, for my kids. Are we still there? Oh, okay. Thought I lost you there. Nope, you're still good. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, I got a question for you. Were you ever pulled into the ring? I used to always love when the, or, or when the wrestlers would, uh, would go through the announce table and they'd take the monitors. Was your camera equipment ever uh, used as a weapon or were you ever pulled into the ring and knocked out or anything? Great question. Uh, at East, did, are any of you familiar with the old ECW arena in Philadelphia? I have. 
Exactly. Okay. Is that at, is that at the uh, at the ballroom? Right. right. Not, not at the ballroom. At the twenty three hundred arena on uh, Oregon Avenue. Anyway, yeah, very, very small arena, and the wildest fans in the whole world. These fans changed the entire. Right. They, the fans that used to be polite and applaud and who yeah. and pass, the ECW fans were totally different than them. ECW fans, if somebody screwed up in the ring, they'd yell out, you effed up, you effed up, you effed up. So I was shooting a match uh, one time, a hardcore match between Terry Funk and uh, Mick Foley, Cactus Jack. And there was a friend of mine back from the neighborhood. Alan, are you still there? Still here. There was a friend of mine in the neighborhood who had never been into a, uh, to a wrestling show and was convinced this is all fake. His name is Joe Baum. Do you, do you remember Joe Baum? Oh, Alan? yeah. Okay. No, well. So Joe Baum came from Israel, and Joe Baum had a very unusual personality. He, said, he goes, go, Billy, Billy, okay, this is all fake, okay? All right, okay? This is Joe Baum, my Joe Baum imitation. He's mentioned in my book, by the way. So I decided to take him to an ECW show. I said, you don't know what you're getting into here. The fans might kill you. Billy, it's okay, all right? So through a friend of mine, I got him into the front row. This particular match was a match where fans were allowed to bring weapons. So during the match, I'm in the middle of shooting pictures, the only photographer around the ring on this side. Terry Funk is over here. Cactus Jack is over here. Some fan throws Terry Funk a frying pan. <laughs> Terry Funk looks over at me and says, after, boom, hits me over the head with the frying pan and literally knocked me out. I saw stars. I never knew what it was like to be knocked out before. So after the show, fans were all coming over me. Oh, uh, and Joe said, Billy, Billy, you acted very good like you were really knocked out. Go! <laughs> oh! <laughs> As for being dragged into the ring, um, there was an incident early in my career, in the early 70s, um, of a wrestler, and I'm looking for the photo in the book, if I'm looking down here, a wrestler named Abdullah the Butcher, who was probably one of the most demented and sick, sickest mental people I've ever met. And he would do anything to uh, make a statement. And- uh, The on. precursor to New Jack. <laughs> oh yeah, New Jack, he, okay, so, let me show you the photo first. Can you all see the photo? Yeah. That's Abdullah the Butcher bleeding, a security guard next to him, and that's my head in his hands. <laughs> so the story behind this is I was in Atlanta, Georgia. I have one question. How'd you take the picture if your head's in his hands? I didn't take the picture, very <laughs> perceptive. There were no cell phones back then. It was a real photographer, a girl named Emmy Yates, who was one of my photographers down there. So I got up on the, uh, the ring to take a picture because Abdullah lost the match. He pushed me off the ring, dragged me by the ringside and started beating me in the head. And I'm going like, this is supposed to be fake, right? And he's hitting me and he took me by the tie and he's like hanging me with the tie, put the tie in his mouth and he chewed the tie, chewed the tie. <laughs> Finally, another wrestler came out and rescued me and they started a feud the following week based upon what he had done to me. Um, the next day at, uh, at TV, Atlanta was interesting because Friday night they did a live show at either the Omni or the City Auditorium. Saturday morning was three hours live on TV, on, uh, TV, uh, TV yes. taping. It wasn't aired at that time. Three hours live on TBS. That afternoon, we'd drive two hours to a spot show in Columbus, and that night to maybe Marietta or someplace for, a, uh, for another show. So uh, I went into the dressing room, and I said to Abdullah, and he allegedly didn't speak English. I said to Abdullah, why did you do that to me last night? He says, you were in the ring. He says, I just, I, I'm Abdullah the Butcher. That's it. You're on me. Just get away from me. And he would, ch there was a Japanese photographer named uh, Jimmy Suzuki that he chased around the ring regularly, regularly. So yeah, it was kind of dangerous. I only wrestled one match, if you want to call it professionally. Um, uh, there's a wrestler named Dory Funk Jr. who was one of the great NWA wrestling champions of all time. He's still alive. He's in his late seventies. He still, still wrestles in Japan periodically, lives in Ocala, Florida. And, uh, 
he brought me, he booked me for one of his small shows for a, a group called Bang. Uh, and their lawyer and I got into an, a legit argument and they set up a wrestling match for us the following month. <laughs> and we worked it, we worked out, we worked out the whole wrestling match. And I, the reason I lost is it was a female referee. And when I was knocked out, knocked down, she stood over me with her skirt over me and I was looking up and I didn't do the count. <laughs> so that was it. So some of the magazines that uh, uh, through the years, this is one, the first magazine that I ever bought when I was a kid in the lobby of Sunnyside Garden in Queens was Wrestling Review. And little did I know that the man who published this, Stanley Weston, would ages from then become my mentor and get me into the wrestling business. Do any of you remember Jerry and Eddie Graham? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're one of the most vicious tag teams in the whole world. So we did at the publishing company, we did 10 wrestling and four boxing magazines. This was the first wrestling magazine that I actually, um, I'm trying to lower your boxes here so I can move this. All right. This is the first wrestling magazine that I ever had a story in. I did a story on the Mongols. I still have this magazine back in my book rack back here. Uh, it's in not great condition, but it's still here. But that was the first magazine I ever wrote for in 1970. This is the Wrestler magazine. I shot that cover photo of Pedro Morales with uh, uh, that little guy, Andre the Giant. <laughs> Andre was a very good friend of mine. Andre uh, used to call me Andre used to call everybody that he liked, he would call them boss. Everybody was boss. And uh, yeah, great guy. And uh, I went on many, many road trips with him. Anybody have any Andre questions? Not a, just a statement or a recommendation. Uh, a couple years ago, the uh, HBO did the Andre the Giant um, special on his life. That was fabulous. I, I, don't, I don't recommend it because they were supposed to put me in it and they ran out of time <laughs> and never got here. No, it's a great bio. And there's also a great book on it as well. Yeah. Uh, this is, we talk about Chicago. Hey, was, the Dick the Bruiser. It, no, this was The Crusher and, the Nick Crusher. Rock and Ray Stevens. <laughs> but this was Inside Wrestling, one of the first magazines that I ever worked for. I did not take this picture, but I, I bought time on a New York City radio station, WHBI 105.9 <clears throat> FM, and did a show called Inside Wrestling, brought to you by The Wrestler and Inside Wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I did audio <clears throat> interviews with all the wrestlers on there. Um, this was 1979 in the publishing company. We decided to do something that was the pro wrestling equal of Sports Illustrated. And we came out with Pro Wrestling Illustrated, which even today is the most famous pro wrestling magazine ever. That cover picture of Dusty Rhodes and Mil Mascaris was one of the hardest things I have ever shot. Looked very easy. Uh, they both had very strong egos. This was backstage at the Westchester County Center in White Plains, New York. They were tag teaming that night as partners. Mil Mascaris, I said to him, can we go backstage and take a picture with Dusty? Well, you know, you asked Dusty to come here. Okay, so I went over to see Dusty. I said, would you mind coming over to Mil Mascaris' dressing room so we can take a picture of you two together. Willie, if the guy with the mask wants a picture, if you will, bring him over to me. So it wasn't gonna work. So two minutes before the match, they're both on the stage, backstage at the Westchester County Center. I just, oh, Dusty, stand here, Milk, go down on knee. Clunk, 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 took three shots. That one made it to the cover. So I love telling that story. Oh. We go back. No, we will get to this one. Uh, this is something I was never involved in. Well, once. This, was, uh, this got me in trouble with a lot of wrestlers. My boss got a set of pictures one time from a photographer in California called uh, to post pictures of girls allegedly wrestling. He put a title on it called it Apartment House Wrestling. We put it in one of our magazines. No wrestling magazine ever sold like this before. Kids would go home <laughs> Ma, Dad, it's a wrestling magazine. I could not bring copies of this into the dressing rooms because the wrestlers were furious that this was in a wrestling magazine. So now after I left that company, I went to a magazine company called Wow, 
you can, wow, right? <laughs> um, it's called Wow Magazine, and it was a, a fabulous magazine where it was done with all color photos, uh, glossy finishes, gloss, glossy pages. Then after that, I started working for a magazine in Italy called Tutto Wrestling, where they told me that every month they were going to translate my column into Italian. So I never knew when I saw my column if they did that or they changed the whole thing. I had no clue, but they were paying me every month. From there, Total Wrestling in uh, England, I became the editor of that magazine. Anybody recognize the guy on the cover? Kurt Angle. I, I, Zachary, I knew you'd be there. <laughs> Who, Zachary, who's this? Scott Steiner. All right, all right. Zachary <laughs> gets 100 in his- He uh, can read. <laughs> uh, Come on, Spirit you'd be an magazine. idiot if you didn't recognize that headdress. Really, really, Fighting Spirit was the uh, uh, one of the newer magazines in uh, the <clears throat> Kingdom. Right now, because of the internet, there's only one wrestling magazine in the United States available that's still Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Um, I'm working for a new British magazine called Inside the Ropes that started last month and that will be on sale at uh, Barnes and Noble and your favorite bookstores and Amazon very shortly. And that's a caricature that some fan drew of me with my famous, uh, I'll see you at the matches. That's how I end all my, uh, that's how I end all my videos. So, all right, let me see what else I've got. So while I'm still looking for more stuff, any more questions? Uh, did you ever do anything with Glow? I did. Um, uh, Glow was uh, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. I shot several of their uh, uh, matches. We didn't do a lot with, uh, with Glow on, in the magazines. It just wasn't a big enough audience the publisher felt for, uh, for Glow. But David McLean, who was the original promoter of that, is a very good friend of mine. Um, the new series of Glow has been on um, Netflix for three seasons and it was just canceled, unfortunately. Yeah, and it was a really good, uh, it was a really good show. It's a really, really good show. Let me see if I... I, I was born in Massachusetts and I um, uh, had someone visit me, Calstat. Haystack Calhoun. Oh, so okay. In the Haystack Calhoun was from uh, 601 pounds from uh, Ar Mor Morgan's Corner, Arkansas. And when I, WWE has me on their network, there's a show on there and a DVD called True Giants. And I did a 15 minute segment on Haystack Calhoun. As a kid, even though I, it was illegal, you had to be 13 or over to get into boxing or wrestling in New York. My father snuck me in through a state athletic commissioner he knew. So as a kid, I got in to see the match where Bruno San Martino body slammed Haystacks Calhoun. Wow. And I talked to Haystacks years ago, uh, before he died, obviously, about that moment. And he was not complimentary. He says, well, Bruno couldn't have done that unless I, you know, I helped him do that. And I was really surprised he said that. It really, uh, really was upsetting to me. Yeah, but he was in overalls and a chain and uh, would greet. Uh, my mom says that's how I got into wrestling because he, he got, gave me that magic touch. Yes, oh, he absolutely did. He was, uh, uh, he, and he was, a, he was a real gentle guy. All the times that I met him and talked to him, he was, uh, he was extremely nice. He really was. What he do when I was interviewing him, he had a huge bucket next to him and he would take chewing tobacco and he'd keep spitting it every 10 seconds as he was talking to me. Um, a lot of my audio interviews with a lot of the great uh, superstars are on my uh, video channel, onewrestlingvideo.com, which is hooked into YouTube. So if you, uh, including interviews with uh, Buddy Rogers, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, uh, from, our, from our generation remember Nature Boy Buddy Rogers before uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair. Hey Bill, has there ever, um, this had to have happened many times, where a wrestler is supposed to lose a match, and when he gets into the ring, he says the hell with it, and he tries to win? Oh, you, well, it's, it's happened because, uh, for example, when uh, Luthez was going to take the NWA World Championship from Buddy Rogers, he told Buddy Rogers, we could do this the easy way or the hard way. Luthez was known as a, uh, a shooter. Uh, he, could, he could handle anybody in the ring, no matter how tough they were. So yeah, that was one incident. And uh, 
yeah, there were a lot of times these things, uh, these things happen where guys had to shoot on other guys to uh, look at the uh, incident with the Montreal screw job. What happened with uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels? Yeah, so these well, things definitely do happen. Yes. Were you in Florida for the infamous um, shoot steel cage match with uh, Bruiser Brody and uh, Lex Luger? No, I was not there. I was not there. I do remember it, but I was not there. Speaking of shooters, what do you think is like the uh, quintessential shoot promo or the quintessential uh, shoot moment from a given wrestling match? Oh, well, anything Arn Anderson would do was mm -hmm. for anything he would do, no matter what match he was, he was in. You know, he always looked at the camera or Harley Race. They always looked at the camera and they were very serious. And that Friday night, Mr. Wrestling number two could be your last night. And you believed it there. So yeah, uh, or any, or in modern day, any promo that The Rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin did as well. And do you think that, uh, that also the seriousness that Arn Anderson and Harley Race exhibited, do you think that contributed to why Jake Roberts was so successful? Well, absolutely. Jake was a, a, a Jake became a student of that era. And oh, Jake was scary believable. Uh, the only guy today that I really find scary, believable, and I don't know, do any of you still follow it? Yes. Yes. Is Randy Orton. Randy oh, Orton. Oh, wow. Randy Orton is incredible. He, my next column for, um, uh, for Inside the Ropes magazine is going to deal with, uh, I knew his grandfather, his father, and Randy. And out of the three of them, Randy is, when you see him, he just looks like he's out of an insane asylum. He can control himself for a little while, but like when the drugs wear off type of feeling, you'd see that crazy look in his face. Nothing like it, yeah. I do I have a soft spot for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I remember Randy Orton's very first match. He was the sweetest guy, he walked around the room, shaking hands with everybody, high-fiving people in the audience. Where was that, Leonard? Oh, this goes back a lot of years. I may still even have the tape. I don't know. But uh, he was just a sweet guy. It was the first time he ever wrestled professionally. Wow. Hey, because we're, oh, we're getting slow on time here, we're, we're another 10 minutes. I have one more video I'd like to show you, some of the uh, classy moments from, so classic moments from some of the interviews that I did. You okay with that? Sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right. Hang on a minute. Or would you rather see me getting beaten up by about fifteen guys in uh, in the magazine office? No. <laughs> What's that? Let's see the first one. All right. Hang on a minute. If you can find it. Yeah. I'm sure. I can. Highlights from my daughter's bat mitzvah. If you want to. What's that? You can show highlights from my daughter's bat mitzvah. If you have nothing else. I, oh, oh, right. I still have that VHS tape somewhere. All right, enjoy this. And mine, by the way. What's that? And mine, by the way. Right, I did. When we first moved and here. And my daughter's, but also. When we first moved here, uh, and Gina was a big wrestling fan too. When we first moved here, a friend of mine from Long Island um, had gotten me to, from my wrestling thing, to... Uh, videotape some friends bar and bat mitzvahs and when I moved here uh I just started doing that here and nice people like Bruce and Alan just were like you know do ours so thank you for letting me do that by the way before we go to the video this is one of my favorite photos here wow. hey. yeah. I used to look like wow. I'm the guy on the uh yes. in the middle. <laughs> try to pick you out Bill Try to, try to. All right, enjoy this. This runs about 10 or 12 minutes. And uh, uh, Alan, we're not going to run out of uh, Zoom time, are we? Uh, no, we're good. Okay. You see Sergeant Slody giving me the Cobra Clutch? Yeah. <laughs> enjoy this. Uh, you people who followed the business should get a kick out of this. Again, and 
You're looking well. Oh, and, yeah. uh, thank you for stopping by here at OneWrestling.com. Well, thanks for having me. It's about time. Master! Master! Just... Master! Anderson! Out So, and I, I, I had, I developed mm -hmm. a bad drug habit. You know, what people do when they're down, you do stupid things to make it worse. And no conspiracy, I just uh, messed up. <laughs> WWE trusted me, and I broke that trust. Every time you turn around, I'm, I have proven myself. Yeah, I get it. Maybe I should have told Hulk about me and his daughter. I did. I had uh, three major strokes, and then I had a heart surgery in July. But uh, everything seems to be coming back in order. Yeah. Hurt him. Hurt. How will you hurt him? How will you hurt him? And I hope that he keeps it up and he keeps put, putting on that kind of a product that uh, fans can come and hopefully enjoy the matches without worrying about what uh, ugliness might come out. And it was too wrestling, especially San Martino, because when you see him come out, you can feel his passion and his persona. And, and he was very aggressive and he's a champion. So, and I admire his physique. So I ended up wrestling James J. Dillon in my first match. So. He wound up managing you eventually, too. He didn't he? beat the dog out of me then, too. So I figured, you know, over the years, I got him back, though. You did? Of course I did. Yeah. He's over in the next room. I'm going to go get him right now. By the way, I'm the leader of the four horsemen, not their manager. Excuse me. Speaking here with Jake the Snake Roberts. And Jake the Snake Roberts, you have officially retired, wrestled your... Uh, your final match uh, against Finn at Wrestle Reunion. What did you feel like the day after? Sure. <laughs> now, let me say something. I don't know if that was a good idea or not. Well, why not? Well, uh, you know, the light probably hit me on top of the head. Well, I have the same problem. As, as what the public has seen, my, my two favorites have given me all the uh, brought my name to the next level would have to be the, the Savage WrestleMania and then the the, uh, the, the, the three matches with Flair in 89. So tell us here from OneWrestling.com, the big question is, is RVD talking with the going to TNA? I'm talking with Bill Everett. He's talking with me. No, I'm not confused. I'm confused. He's very confused. He just doesn't. Mr. Backlund, once again this year, you're passed over the WWE Hall of Fame. What's your reaction to this? Mr. You know, cancer doesn't uh, discriminate against anybody. And uh, I sure do got it. You know, I got it in uh, like two different places. And uh, uh, the kind that it's treatable, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a death warrant. Let me tell you something, Rock and Roll Express, and this is the last Ah. Uh. Hey, listen very carefully. You cannot be. The men not express in a wrestling match. You can't beat us in a boxing match. You can't beat us singing, and you can't beat us dancing. And if you want to, we can have a beauty contest, baby. You can't beat us at nothing. How would be here with you? No, Wait a second here. How would you book Scott Hall's son against no, I Larry Zabisco? I thought Larry over. That's it. He put, put, Larry does the run in and beats everybody. That's people it. always say. Whenever Sid gets called, he's got to go and play softball instead. What do you say? I say that's crap. You have a, you have a new mentor? <laughs> Who's your mentor? <laughs> Larry Holmes? <laughs> Larry, what are you, what are you, the Nigerian nightmares, what, what are you planning to do with these guys? Hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to take them out to lunch because they look like they might be hungry. <laughs> the claw. Can I see an example of your claw, by the way? Excellent. Thank you. It's been and for all you people who don't, A, boom, back at you. Still, this is Bill After with the lovely Maurice. And I'll tell you about I love how you said my name, by the way, Maurice. Uh, well, if I played the bet 30 years ago, they would have bet that Tommy Rich would have been one of the first ones that died. I out there bet, should have bet on that. And then uh, as far as my wife and me, 30 years, uh, three healthy daughters and seven healthy grandkids later, you know, it's just great. It's, uh, I'm a lucky man. Nikita and Ivan, we've always made our money the old-fashioned way. We beat people for it. 
<laughs> anyway, tell everybody, look out to the camera here at OneWrestling.com and let everyone know what you're doing these days. Uh, these days, I'm working for a drug prevention program, so I take a resident from Minnesota Teen Challenge into the junior high school and high school health classes to share their personal stories of addiction. How did you feel going from a traditional wrestler to Doink the Clown? Uh, actually, the, my first reaction was like, I want up him, baby. I'm the guy who shaved Jerry Lawler's head, but then going to New York and I, what a legacy. Well, the new kid, I like that, uh, Dolph Ziggler. I think he'll be a star one day. But what I'm trying to say is this, the gobbledygooker was a good thing. And the author of that idea deserves to be left alone. Um, Vince McMahon. These are good. Vince McMahon. Um, visionary. Visionary. Okay. And you would like to? No. Nope. Okay. Brock Lesnar. You know when I get when I expand, I get myself in trouble. So. Um, your dad's health has not been well, but um, people really love your dad, Vern Gagne. Oh, we all did. Yeah. Can you give us just a little update? Well, on, uh, you know, he has he has that horrible disease, uh, the Alzheimer's. Right. Right. And uh, he has had some problems. Well. Uh, Jory Funk's method of training uh, begins with safety. Make sure that the kids are safe when, they, when they're inexperienced. I got to tell you, man, I'm very blessed. I got an awesome God that I worship over. And I think I found the founder you, but I ain't going to tell anybody yet my secret. But try to fool us. <laughs> you know, try to, try to do something original. Try to do, it, it's the guys that get a bite if you just happen to hit somebody in the head with a coconut. Yeah, it gets a bit of attention. That's right, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, I just need to stop you for one second. If you wouldn't mind looking at the camera and just saying, Don Morocco. Don Morocco, brother. Thank you. Okay. Tony Atlas, your contract with the WWE is up. Yes. Sad, sad, sad day. But, and who in the hell is the rock? You're talking about an ECW original? A WCW champion, a former member of the NYC and TNA, and the toughest man ever wear a dress. But uh, that's not wrestling, but I'm saying. What? If you were. World Division, I wouldn't call it wrestling. What do you call it? TNA. TNA, which, yeah. uh, which has a large <laughs> impact on know. today's wrestling. <laughs> but with WWE, you know, I needed time off, I needed time away, and I did need to get out of my contract. And I don't think they actually wanted to let me on my contract. And I had to kind of jump through some hoops. Uh, especially, for example, uh, country music. Is it really country music anymore with uh, uh, like Taylor Swift, for example? Are your broadcasting days finished? Oh, yeah. I don't ever want to call another wrestling match. Whoa. Uh, you don't ever? Why? You were, I mean, you were phenomenal. I think that's too hard. I, I did it for 10 years, and I'm done calling wrestling matches. That's I, you are. Well, you know, last time I saw you was at the Gay 90s bar, and it was awesome because you were there. <laughs> there was a lot of guys huddled around you, and I felt kind of uncomfortable because nobody was paying attention to me, and all the guys were on you, too. Dude. So there's, a, there's a long story, and if I ever do a book, other than you, is there someone in the Hall of Fame? Actually, he's not in the Hall of Fame. Other than you, is there someone else who's not in the Hall of Fame that you would love to see put in there? Oh, I'd love to see Stinger put in there, and uh, I don't know if she is or not, Miss Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. Do you mind giving us a damn? Well, uh, you know, see, right now, you know, this is what makes me mad with people like me because you're always coming around here asking me to say one word. And you know what? I am sick and tired word. of that. And I would just like to say, damn! Oh, okay. Uh, we, we will look you up. And uh, what's that? I mean, it's fine. Yes, you are. You are. There are a couple of things I like about her, but I can't put my finger on it. With WWE Hall of Fame this year, you passed over again. One of the fans wrote me an email. Don't you have to be dead to be in the Hall of Fame? No. One of the fans wrote me an email. They want to know your reaction to being passed over. I didn't even know I should consider it. I think I'm going in the WWE Rehab Hall of Fame. You did like to uh, give a little Paul Barrow goodbye to the people here at uh, OneWrestling.com? Rest in peace. We'll see you at the matches. All right. Well, Bill, that was fantastic. Hope you enjoyed uh, thank it. you so much for give, giving your time to us.
Wait, wait, I have another hour and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's fine. Hey, can, I, can, I, can I ask a question? 2 a.m. and 3.30. No, if, do we have uh, two or three minutes for a few more questions? Sure, that, go ahead. Right ahead. Uh, Bill, Len Berman here. Uh, thank you for that. It was a wonderful trip down memory lane. Thank you. Uh, I know a number of uh, wrestlers have gone into the movie industry. Yes. And uh, I was wondering, uh, has uh, the, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, the big guy uh, done anything other than uh, the Rock Princess Bride? Who? Uh, the movie, The Princess Bride. Andre, uh, Jones, Andre, Andre the Giant. Uh, Andre. Andre. Andre the Giant. Has he done anything other than The Princess Bride? Yes, he died. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> has he performed in no. any other movie? Not as far as not as not as far as I know. Okay. Good this, question, though. Thank you. There's a Tommy. lot of guys who went into the uh, movie industry. Including, of course, uh, um, well, well, Dave Bautista recently. Uh, the Rock, yeah, there are there are a lot of them. This is back in uh, Minneapolis. Bobby Heenan, Mick Bockwinkel, Ray wow. Stevens in the 1970. Hey, Bill, I know that uh, uh, Jim Hurd had a. Hold on one minute. This is when someone says they want to take a picture. This is the picture. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, Jim Hurd didn't have the greatest reputation in the world, but what do you think was Jim's greatest accomplishment to the uh, wrestling industry? Leaving it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say that. Bill, what do you think of AEW? Oh, I love it. I love it. Right. Okay. The only thing is the last few months, month, months and a half, they've been doing a lot of WWE type of skits. Yes. They weren't going to do that at the beginning. Like, la did you watch it last night? So this whole thing with uh, MJF, nice Jewish kid, Michael J. Right? Friedman yep. from Long Island, uh, and Chris Jericho, that they're going to have a challenge over a, a, a steak dinner. I mean, just, no, doesn't work for me. Too much stick. Not into that. So I have another what do you think of question. Sure. What do you think of John Cena? Well, I think he's great. He, one of the, he made, he did more Make a Wish, uh, granted more Make a Wishes than any other celebrity in the world. Okay. He's a great guy. I've known him since he was probably, oh, a teenager. Uh, he's wonderful and he's an excellent technical wrestler. Why does he get such a such a such a negative rap by people? Because people because it's the internet. The internet does that. Uh, the, because he was there in the WWE for a long time, and sometimes people get tired of the same stars, etc. Had it been the territorial system, he would have been gone for six months and, be, and back again. Thank you. This was really great. Thank you for doing this tonight. This I really appreciate awesome, it. Awesome, Bill. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, hey, Bill. Bill, there's me with the boss. And uh, my book is available. It's Wrestling Fixed. It's, it's on chat. I sent out the link, guys. You, all you have to do is go on chat, click click on the link. It'll take you right to Amazon. You can buy the book. Or, or the audio book. On, it's nine hours. It's, um, I re, it's <laughs> me doing the book, and all my voices are in there as well. Um, and if you do get the book and you'd like an autographed, personalized sticker to put on the... This is, I had a friend who used to work for Mike Douglas, and he said when Mike did records, the only way he could sign them to people all around the world was he wrote a sticker to Michael, best wishes, and then they'd mail the sticker. So you can actually take the sticker and put it right on the front page here. And Bill's uh, Bill's email address is at the top of the chat. It was one of the first things we put on there. So if you go scroll to the top of chat, you will see Bill's uh, email address for that. And if you go down to the bottom of the chat, you will see Thank an you, opportunity to make a donation in Bill's honor to FJ. We're more than happy to accept that for you. And of course, we'll let know, Bill know that you've made that donation. We won't tell him the amount, of course, but we'll be happy to tell him. That well, you the, the donation, I still have $130,000 on my mortgage. So is that, <laughs> you know? So anybody wants to donate the 135000 that's great. We very much appreciate it. Yeah, that would be great. Actually, it's only one thirty that I need. All right, no, well, that's 5000 a tip. That's a tip, Bill. <laughs> Thank you all for... Uh, uh, for coming in, uh, you know, a few months, maybe we can do this again. Great job. Where's the next show? It's only 5.08 in California. 
Thanks oh, so that's much. right. Okay, well, I'm here all night. So uh, <laughs> next show will be uh, twenty seven. Next show, Bruce, Bruce and I, go, Bruce and I, are going into my music room for the next show, right, Bruce? Yeah. All right. Take the care. Next, uh, next Thank you all. Is October twenty seven at eight o'clock. By the way, oh. you're mentioning October, the twenty second of this month. Next week, I'm going to be seventy five. How does Whoa. That hey, uh, happy, happy birthday, Bill. Bill. Now. Happy birthday, Bill. Thank you for your presentation. What's that? Happy birthday. Well, thank you. Happy I'm birthday, buddy. That. But um, uh, Alan, Alan and I used to meet some somewhere around my birthday time every year, and we can't do it this year because of COVID. We can uh, meet in the driveway, and, and we can scream at each other. Oh, I like that. That's a wrestling <laughs> oriented thing there. Yeah. Well, well, when we can, we'll go to the Country Club Diner. I'll you got it. You, you got it. You got it. I love that place. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Sign off. Thank you. See you at the matches eventually. Okay.